the Daily Mail is either being really weird or having a totally normal one, depending on your point of view. But it appears to have launched this kind of tactical voting campaign today to stop what it calls a Starmer supermajority. Now, supermajority is not really a term that I had ever stumbled across before this particular election campaign. But the Daily Mail appears to be seeking to persuade its readership that a huge Labour landslide is, first of all, inevitable, which I disagree with, by the way. I don't think anything's inevitable. And polls can often be wrong. And I've even read various think pieces which say that the Labour Party don't think that it's inevitable either. But the other thing that they're trying to convince their readership is that it would necessarily be a terrible thing. And that's what I want to discuss with you this evening. Do you think that a large majority is always a bad thing, no matter what party gets it? 03456060973. Or do you think, like somebody I was speaking to the other evening at a very political event, that actually a large majority is the only way that Labour can usher in change? And, and lest we forget, change was the one word that was emblazoned across the Labour manifesto. They are promising what are fairly seismic changes, despite what their critics might say. They've got, no matter what you think, the next government have got an enormous job on their hands. They're inheriting a lot of problems. And this person I was speaking to said, in order to be able to overturn some of the challenges that our country faces right now and to usher in the change that they're promising, Labour actually need that large majority. So where do you sit on this? 03456060973. The reason that I think this Daily Mail piece is so weird is um, here's one of the things that it says in it. A general election can occasionally have a seismic effect. Labour's landslide victory in 1945 led to the creation of the NHS, the welfare state and the nationalisation of much of British industry. Well, whatever you think about the last one, I think we can all agree that the NHS and the welfare state are good things. And yet the Daily Mail article, the very nub of it, the crux of it is that no one should ever have a supermajority. But that they then go on to say, Margaret Thatcher, and you know, I don't read the Daily Mail on the regs. I read it Saturday morning because I read all the papers before I come to air. But my impression is that Margaret Thatcher is somewhat of a hero for the Daily Mail reader and Daily Mail writers. They've written, Margaret Thatcher's electoral triumph in 1979 marked the moment when this country's long economic decline and the insidious defeatism of its ruling class began to be reversed. So they've given two examples there of where a a majority brought about real seismic change. And that second one in particular, you would think that their readership would agree was a good thing. The first one, particularly the NHS, you would hope that their readership would agree is a good thing. So they're saying sometimes a landslide majority can be great, but a majority with Starmer at the helm is something to be feared. The author Stephen Glover, he somewhat contradicts himself when he says, it is dangerous in any democracy for one political party to be so dominant. I certainly wouldn't relish the prospect of the Tories being handed so much power unchallenged, unchecked and untrammeled for a generation. I mean, that's interesting, isn't it? Because I didn't read any pieces of this nature, either prior to or immediately after the Conservatives winning that enormous 80 seat majority in 2019 when Boris Johnson managed to turn the general election into effectively a a referendum on getting Brexit done. They won an enormous majority famously and harped back to it on numerous occasions as proof that every single thing they did the entire country was in total agreement with. And yet the Daily Mail was curiously as far as I know silent about that. They weren't talking about super majorities and the dangers to democracy there. You know, as far as I can see it, there are there are two flavours of people who wouldn't want Keir Starmer and his Labour Party to win a big majority. And I'm going to put them into two camps. So your first camp is Daily Mail people. We we've already explored their position a little bit. The second camp I'm going to call the Owen Jones 
people. <laughs> so I, I'm sure you're aware of this because it was everywhere. But recently, Owen Jones rescinded his lifelong membership of the Labour Party because he said that he could no longer support Keir Starmer. He felt that Keir Starmer had lurched too far into the centre ground on a, on a number of issues. But one of his reasons for supporting independent and green candidates in several constituencies was he said... It wouldn't be great for Labour to have so much unchecked power and I would prefer to see them having to defer to people like the Green Party and and ideally in a kind of coalition style situation. So two, on the face of it, very disparate groups there. You've got the Daily Mail people and the Owen Jones people, both of whom wouldn't want Starmer to have this so-called supermajority, but for very different reasons. So I wonder if you can see the sense in either of those arguments, 03456060973. Isabel Hardman, who's a journalist writing for the iNews, she disagrees with that. She says, the past 14 years have taught us that it's very, very difficult to pursue some of the pressing reforms the country needs, even with a a reasonable majority. And then she also seems to argue that the Lib Dems didn't keep the Tories in check in coalition, which I'm not sure I agree with, because... The Tories definitely got more Tory after 2015. I think there was some difference in the coalition government to when we went purely conservative. But nonetheless, I'm interested in what you think. There is no such thing as a super majority. Uh, if, if, if any party gets a majority of two and they can continue to uh, govern with the majority of two, this is a Tory scare monger. Um, it doesn't matter whether you've got a majority of two or of 200. We do not have a, an American um, presidential system. We have a very simple parliamentary system. If you have a majority of two or three, you govern as the majority party. I understand and what you're all of, all of this business about terrifying mega, mega Labour majority, this is another, I'm sorry, it's another scaremongering Tory tactic. Well, I think in terms of what the, the Daily Mail are attempting to do with their tactical voting campaign, mm-hmm. I, I, I think I agree with you. I think it is an attempt to scaremonger. But do you not think that there's something in when the next government comes to govern, if they've got an enormous stonking majority, they can pretty much do whatever they want unchallenged? can't they? Isn't that the argument? No, that's absolute nonsense. Whether you have a majority of three or 300, you do what you do. And large majorities, and Harold Wilson in 1964 came in with a majority of two or three, and then having given the country what he wanted to do, he went back to the electorate and he won an even larger majority. The, the, the government can rise and fall on these numbers. There is no such thing in British politics as a mega stronger majority. And it is, I'm afraid, it's a, it's a Tory scare tactic. I thought it myself is a scare tactic. And I think it's also uh, a desperate attempt to get back voters to the Conservative Party who've dis- uh, you know, deserted them quite rightly. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's just a scare tactic. And as far as a large majority is concerned, or a mega majority, I confess I'm not a Labour voter. I don't support a lot of many of any, I don't think, of their policies. However, as the gentleman before said, whether they've got five or 50, or 150, it's academic. The only concern I've got is if Labour have a massive majority Mm. and then they somehow morph into far left, uh, then I think it could be dangerous. But that's... Well, I think there's there's little danger of that happening under Starmer. That's the impression that I get. But we, you do want a robust opposition, don't you, in, in any healthy democracy? I, I have voted Conservative for many years. Mm. I've left the party. I won't be voting for them again. And I don't actually even think they're fit to be an opposition. Carol, just out of interest, when did they lose you? They left. Oh, I'm glad you said that, actually, because, you know, the 
I read an article by Tom Tugendhat today in the mm. Telegraph, which was, um, I think, going to be very counterproductive to what he was hoping to achieve. When did they leave me? Um, I think it was probably before Boris, if I'm honest. I think it was perhaps around the time of Theresa May and all the shenanigans and mm. the lies and the what have you. And since then, I sort of stuck through for quite a while, gave it a chance. Then um, Boris was an absolute scandal. I I just can't even get my head around that. Mm. Um, You know, at the time he was partying, I was arranging a small funeral for my husband and couldn't invite the people I wanted to. Um, Carol, I'm so sorry to hear that. No, it's it's okay, but um, I don't think they realise. I mean, if I'm honest, and I shouldn't say dishonour, if I'm honest, I hope they're absolutely obliterated, <laughs> smashed to the ground. Well, um, they they need they need the the big majority to get through the program, and uh, what Starmer? I mean, from from four years ago when. Uh, I'm a Labour Party supporter, always been all my life, and four years ago we were dead and buried, mm. uh, mainly because the, um, the, there was no real control. And one thing that Starmer strikes me as being, I don't agree with everything he says, but you can't, any political party you're going to have... No, uh, I think that's doubts. healthy, not to agree with everything someone well, says. Well, of course, um, and, and, uh, but one thing he is, <laughs> he's a good manager. Mm. And he's, he's, he's managed to drag the party up to the level now where it's going to be a, a decent government. And he's, he's, he strikes me as be, being a bit of a control freak. Which well, is, he certainly uh, takes swift and decisive action, doesn't he? Yes. Um, yes, he does. And, and uh, that's important when you've got a large majority because uh, one example of being arrogant and thinking you'll win everything in, uh, was Scotland. <laughs> mm. I mean, the, 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 he won't, they won't make that mistake again while well, Starmer's still the leader because of the arrogance of saying the, a donkey, you would vote for a donkey as long as I had a Labour. Right. And, and what, what happened is the Scottish Nationalists stole all the Labour policies. Mm. I mean, basically, that's what happened. There were a, there were a nothing, nothing party, and all of a sudden, um, Labour was talking about things, about doing policies and not doing them. And, of course, the SNP said to themselves, well, that's good. I'll take a few of them. I mean, it is extraordinary. I was in a school in Scotland just recently, and there was a map on the wall of one of the classrooms that showed the the various constituencies and and who currently is the SNP. And it is awash with SNPs, uh, of MPs who are from the SNP. I mean, the majority that they have there at the moment, may all change, of course, next week, is... Vast. Yeah, well, the, the way to stop massive majorities and, and getting too arrogant is what they've got in Scotland. They've got they've had this sixteen year old vote for for a long time mm. there, and they've got a they've got a, a proportional representation system there. I mean that that stops parties from being too arrogant and too. Um, I mean, eventually, I think that's what's going to happen in this country. It may not may not happen within the next ten years, but it will happen, I think, because the, the majority of the public wants it to happen. That's no, interesting. That's interesting. Just they as you for it before, but they, mm. they, they will know. Just as you said um, that, Ben, there what, was there was a text that came in that said we need proportional representation. End of. And a lot of people seem to be of of that opinion that that the only way forward for healthy democracy in this country? One thing I'd like to start off with is uh, this conversation so far, this uh, hour, you've had some cracking callers on, some really good points. Um, So for myself, I think that I'd like to see a Labour majority. Mm. Um, Well, it is my politic. However, the reason why I'm I say that is because when you've got very, very important changes in legislation that you need to put through you need a healthy majority in order to do it. If you think back to what happened in 2017, Theresa May mm. had a majority, but then she gambled it and she actually reduced it just at the same time that Brexit was trying to come through. Yes. Now, I personally thought that the reason why she went so hard on Brexit 
and uncompromising was to woo the Tory right. Mm. And it goes down to party discipline then. And you're spending more time managing your party discipline than actually trying to enact the stuff that you want to do. So the more your majority, the less you have to worry about party discipline, unless there's a serious coup, which I don't think potentially Starmer's going to see because, as the uh, caller before me said, he's he, he's got a good he's a good manager and he's got good discipline. Mm. Now, with the Brexit referendum, we reached a point where every it was so polarised that every single MP that was in the chamber couldn't agree on anything. There was I remember a, uh, a night where there was about eight versions of Brexit put forward to the House. Yeah. And at the time, I really wanted the second referendum. And I think that was the one which came closest. But actually, every single one of them failed. Now, if Theresa May had had a stronger majority, there was a good chance that might have gone through. Or there might have been a good chance that she'd have had her version of Brexit through, which would probably not have been as severe as what we ended up with. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it was. You're you're correct that what Theresa May negotiated was marginally less severe than the disastrous Brexit that we ended up with. But is there an argument to say that Brexit is a once in a lifetime occurrence, and that using that as your measure of whether or not a party should have a majority doesn't really take into account how democracy operates the rest of the time? Oh yeah, okay, I can see the argument. Brexit was probably the biggest um, change to the UK but in peacetime that we'll, we'll certainly see in my generation. Oh, definitely. But it's, yeah. but it's, extre- it, it's an extremely good example as well. Now, prior to Brexit, we also had austerity. Mm. And we are still feeling the effects of austerity now. And so if we are to make some changes that can make the country better, make it fairer, maybe uh, bring some... Um, justice to what happened over COVID, maybe make our uh, water company ownership uh, more favourable to the British people, all of this sort of stuff is going to need big changes. So I think in this particular case, we're going to need it. Okay. Rick, thank you for your call. I am inclined to agree with you, although I had... Somebody else texted into the studio who I've, I've lost their text now because it's disappeared from my screen. But they said something along the lines of the, the larger your majority, the more MPs could potentially rebel or defy the whip. So it's not necessarily true that having a large majority allows you to push through policy without challenge. I see that as an argument as well. I think that there is sense being spoken on all sides here, which is the conversations that I love having with you the most.